Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Shamir. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Scylla. Uh, and today we are doing a webinar on how blockchain is driving mobility. Uh, and the star of the show is uh, Benjamin Diggles uh, with, uh, with Constellation Labs. And uh, I'm going to start off by confessing that uh, mobility and blockchain is not an area that I have much expertise in. But that's why we have Benjamin. Right. Uh, and so I'm going to be learning as much as um, any of you, probably more. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask some questions and then try and understand the, the wealth of knowledge that Benjamin is bringing. But I'd love to have you guys out in the audience. Uh, I see a few people are, uh, are live now. I'd love to have you guys uh, ask questions as well. So Benjamin, uh, I see you're wearing your trademark uh, shoes. Uh, Benjamin and I were on a panel a few months ago, and we all we, the kind of the, the panel was characterized by everybody having an interesting set of shoes. Uh, but uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, right? Like, how did you end up here in, in Portland working with Constellation? Uh, and then I'd love to get into what Constellation does. A little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, from here, I appreciate you having me. Um, I always like to be trepidatious around saying that I'm a, an expert. You know, I've been in this industry now for about a year and a half, um, but that's kind of been almost like pressure cooker. So I've, I've learned quite a bit. It's like accelerated learning, um, and I feel like the activities I'm involved in kind of put me at the tip of spear when you think of mobility and some of these other things. So I'm excited to talk about those topics and what I know. Um, naturally, there's a lot more outside of what I have to offer. So there's that. Um, this is true, and, and I feel it very much in, in kind of fintech that I'm the expert but it's like you know the there's that thing right like there's this uh, chart which says when you're just starting off you think you know nothing and after a while you think you know everything but the true experts are the people who know that they know nothing. right right I, I, hopefully that's where i'm at but uh so yeah benjamin diggles i'm the vp of uh, business development for constellation labs um the company is based in the bay i work here remotely from portland oregon uh, i am a portland native so uh, i love this city and it's kind of a big reason why I want to stay put here. Uh, and I also believe that there's a lot of kind of untapped dormant activity, especially in distributed ledger that's about to take place. I mean, you're starting to see with companies like Scylla. Um, and there's more in town than you might think. Yeah, and that's, I just feel like I keep discovering more and more. Um, but as far as my background, um, you know, I've been in technology for over 20 years. I built, you know, my first website when I was uh, 17. That was back in 1997, so you can kind of do the math from there. Um, you know, I grew up on a, a sheep farm here in Portland, so I didn't really have those roots, but I got really obsessed with computers. Um, and the last 10 years of my career I've spent in enterprise. For some reason, I felt like attacking problems that require pretty intense SLAs and scale was something that intrigued me. Um, they're longer term engagements, they're more intricate, there's a lot of constituents. And I really took kind of, um, I guess, an interest in that. I worked for Web Trends. Um, which is kind of a Portland darling as far as a, a company that's done some pretty interesting stuff in the technology space for about five years. Um, and that's when I got really obsessed, I guess, really interested in data. That's so I was like, oh, wow, like data really is, um, you know, as they say, the new oil. But at the same time, we're all kind of working in these pockets of refineries trying to make sense of it all, if you will. And, and so, to find interesting pockets and collect it. Correct, correct. And, um, so I was working for Oracle for about four years prior to getting into blockchain, and I was always, and maybe this is my Portland roots, I was always very intrigued with um, freeing my fellow man. Like, what are ways we can balance the wealth? What, what are the ways we can hold, you know, or organizations accountable to their marketing messages and their employees to try to get you to take action and whatnot? Uh, and don't get me wrong, that stuff plays a role, but I think that largely in the digital landscape in the last 15 years, it's gotten rather nefarious and uh, less clear, and people are kind of being taken advantage of. And so I thought, man, I really want to put effort into this. So I started this special project I was working on, and a buddy approached me. He's like, dude, you need to get into blockchain. And so I started researching it and realized, wow, um, while I had a, a deep knowledge on Bitcoin and crypto and kind of what that, that world looked like, I was unaware of what distributed ledger technology really was. And so I, I leaned in and started understanding the technology of this immutable ledger and got really excited um, and then was pulled into this group constellation. So, um, you know, to, to tell a little bit about what constellation is, um, they, they are a, a distributed ledger technology startup based in the Bay, um, largely focused as an infrastructure tool. And, and that's kind of interesting to point out because I feel a lot of the movements that are taking place uh, are on the application layer. What are things that we can build on top of this technology 
to create some sort of a new um, you know, business model. And we're really around that kind of like, hey, before you build, let's make sure all your ducks are in a row and that infrastructure is in place. Um, we're, you know, to kind of get a little nerdy, we're our directed acyclic graph, which is um, kind of key to our architecture, which when you think about blockchain being something that linearly adds a new block to every transaction to the ledger, a directed acyclic graph is really almost like a net that every time something's added, it may almost kind of like a bit torrent add pieces to another part or a different node within that graph, allowing it to speed up from a transactional throughput perspective. Um, and this is interesting to us because um, it's less about how do we make that application work um, efficiently and more about how do we build a foundation to allow any application to work efficiently so that those that come in and bolt onto a direct basic graph can use that mass throughput consensus model to really you know, engage that, that application layer. Um, to be a little more specific about what Constellation does, um, really our value is around the validation um, and the notarization of data at the source. Uh, so when you think about like Uber as an example, Uber is bringing in so much data. Every time you open that app, you're creating new data types and, and new data sets. Um, and there's millions of users using it right now. You know, um, that's, a, that's a lot of data coming in. So for example, you know, Uber for them to deal with a dispute, say Shamir didn't like his ride or something happened and you go in and you try to dispute it. For them to run systems to be able to kind of forensically figure out what took place in that dispute costs them more money than it does to just reward you the money back. And that's because collecting data with a fire hose like that and sifting and sorting it and creating the action systems within real time is very complex. Um, this is where central trust really comes in. And so we're thinking, how do we take that central trust and create a net so that when that data comes in, all those data points are being attached to that net and within that, there's a validation criteria that says, hey, when this data comes in, if it doesn't match these types of parameters, if you will, then either just, dis, dis, you know, discharge or disregard it um, or make it actionable. And so this allows a decentralized architecture to truly take in mass amounts of data and make sense of it rather quickly. Um, and when you look at like uh, autonomous vehicles or artificial intelligence or machine learning, the thing that they all have in common is that for the true effect of their promise to take place, it requires a ton of data. Yes. And, and that has been one of the, the issues with kind of block, the earlier version of the blockchain, right? Uh, they came with, uh, you know, Bitcoin was the original, of course. But, uh, you had systems like Ethereum, which came with this uh, so much promise of being able to do like actual computation. But then once you actually got into it and started using it, you realize that the the, the consensus and the distribution was actually a massive burden, which meant that it takes, uh, you know, it, it, Ethereum's throughput is whatever, a few dozen transactions per right. second, uh, and you're not going to be able to store, you know, even a few megabytes of data storage on Ethereum is, is insanely complex, right? Correct. It, it really only works for like sort of very small uh, amounts of code and very specific types of transactions, which work in, which are still quite useful in the financial world. But as you said, when you look at kind of the mobility space or anything that's sort of taking in data from the real world, the sensors nowadays, the internet of things, uh, all the apps that we have on our phones, they generate massive amounts of data. Uh, a car, which is driving around, with, like is going to generate like uh, you know, one of these autonomous cars, and everybody's it, trying to build it. They generate so much data that it's hard to imagine how that would ever work on one of the more traditional blockchains. You need something totally new. Um, but talk to us a little bit about the benefits of kind of managing that sort of data through a blockchain. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, currently you're right. When you have all this data coming in, the only way, you, you know, you have to deal with trust and validation. Like, is it valid data? Because when you think about that artificial intelligence example, when you have that much data coming in, a lot of it's going to be crap. Yeah. So how do you know it's crap? And if that crap makes its way in your models or algorithm, you're going to result in crap. Um, so therefore, you need some sort of governance, which comes down to a central authority. So who trusts that central authority? And do you have the processing power in order to actually make sense of it in a, in a meaningful amount of time? And, and the answer is no. And it is a catch-22 when you think about Ethereum, that the more people that join the network, the more bogged down it becomes. So the more popular, the worse it is. So it's, it, it is a tough thing. Right. Yeah, like, uh, like, 
weeks, for example, it uh, almost crashed it. <laughs> right, right. And that's like a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Still a very real problem. I mean, it reminds me back of the early TCP IP where we had like XML and RSS come out and they started trying to really push these syndication pipes to do things well beyond what they should. Yeah. Um, but it was the early internet, just like we're dealing with early blockchain. It's like, okay, how do we press these systems to scale to do things that are very interesting when we're not really quite sure if that's the right protocol or you know channel in order to do that sort of function. So this is the reason why it's so important to handle big data. And the other thing to think about is, you know, we think about a central authority, say they did have some massive quantum computer that could handle this, you know, validation and trust and governance, who owns that? You know, who, who owns that quantum computer, that central computer? Is it Google? Is it Amazon? Um, and and then it starts to fall them. apart there. You know? And do you trust them? Right. So do you trust them to own your data? Uh, because you might be driving that car around and it's the car is going to be generating a huge amount of data and that data is potentially useful to put into an algorithm or a model or something. But you trust yourself to give it to them? I mean, I have an Alexa and a Google Home. And I keep them unplugged most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, it's really just a question of like trust and hey. And the flip side, I'm like, if you can push an over the air update to my car, which means that it just gets better at like, you know, it has all these features, right? Like lane keeping assist and blah, blah, blah. Those get marginally better. I'm like, yeah, I want the, the you know, the safety benefits of like, it, it, it gets better at like breaking if somebody runs out or whatever. At the same time, I'm not sure I want to share my data with right. to get those, uh, those benefits. But it really comes down to trust. I think in, in, in many ways, that's the power of blockchain is that it allows you to, to sort of be more transparent about what you're trusting, whom you're trusting, and why you're trusting. Yeah, I mean, it's a big issue. I mean, you've got to imagine Google wants more data, but at the same time, they don't want more data. You know, because it's like, when you think about GDPR lawsuits oh, yeah. and the regulations, like they are up against something that's much bigger than them just capitalizing on the data. It's like, okay, we have to do the right thing with this. Yeah. And they want to know everything about Shamir, but Shamir has no way of knowing anything about them. You know, the stuff goes in this black box and, and that's that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's so many scary examples, right? Like now my Google phone, uh, it actually, like they just enabled a feature a few months ago where it recognizes my kids' faces. So I can click on the on the photos app and it finds all my like my daughter's photos from the time she was like two weeks old. Right. And it's able to recognize that one two week old photo is my daughter's and the other two week old photo is my son's and separate out the two timelines, right? Mm -hmm. like, huh. They actually look like <laughs> it's bizarre. The yeah. brother sister, and yet the algorithm can separate them. Uh, and I'm, it's great, I can just find all my daughter's photos, but at the same time, I'm like that the benefit is great, but then what else could this data, uh, data be used for? And that's the scary part, right? Yeah. I don't, I want to take advantage of that algorithm and I don't mind Google using the data to tune that algorithm. Right. At the same time, I don't want that data, definitely not. Uh, and I don't, I'm not very happy if that uh, algorithm is being used for, let's say, facial recognition at border crossings. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure that, you know, that that's, the, the dual use nature of so many of these technologies and the data itself is, is one of the driving factors, at least for me, behind kind of uh, blockchain. So you can at least say, hey, my data went into tuning this algorithm. Are you okay with that? And then uh, that algorithm was used for all these purposes. I'm okay with that too. But if that algorithm is used for something else, I might not be happy. And at least maybe I stop sharing data or whatever. Yeah, it's tough. There's, a, there's the ebb and flow, or I guess the balance, if you will, of. I want the convenience, and that's really what's ensnared us in the last, I think, 20 years of the internet is the promise and convenience and wonder of all this magical technology. But in return, we're giving away all of our uh, personal data, and we don't really have a way to control it. You, you know, your daughter doesn't, she didn't opt into her face being recognized, right? And now there's an algorithm that's being tuned to her face, and she doesn't really have the opportunity to opt out or maybe control the algorithm and maybe have the, the levers to say, Hey, I'm going to post a picture of your daughter on on Instagram, and you get a push notification saying, "Hey, they don't allow this because they control it." Right now, that's not. Uh, and the, the thing I worry most is you know, she says, but then she's by the time she's 18, 20, and legally able to make those decisions, she will probably she might very well just grow up in a generation just to consider this normal, right? Right. <laughs> and so, at what point do we just go sliding all the way down that slippery slope to just assuming that the ball knows whatever? 
what I mean, whatever massive right. uh, com co uh, company is born and created in the next 15 years. All of them are trying to be that, right? Uh, controls everything and knows everything <laughs> all the time. And you never have any control of it, but people just accept that. Yeah. Uh, and that's good. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. It's a very slippery slope. But at the same, I always said we were like frogs warming in the Facebook water, you know, just like you get used and conditioned, ah. you know, and then eventually you're boiling, you don't know it. Um, so, yeah, I completely understand. But I think that there, you know, when you think about what happened with Mary, obviously, we just trust hotels. We, of course, here's my password, here's my credit card. They lost, what, 300 million, 500 million, somewhere around there, people's records, including passports, over a two year period. Like, it was bad. Um, so then all of a sudden, people are getting a little bit more hesitant. They're starting to pay attention to those things that pop up around cookies and sharing data and those privacy concerns. These mechanisms that the companies have to put out because those G GDPR lawsuits and regulation lawsuits. And I'm thrilled that there are some third parties out there that are pressing, you know, these companies to be a little bit more, you know, appropriate with their data. And at least, you know, uh, well, the, the, the kind of the data loss issue is just sort of getting down. Right? Like, right. You, know, you hear so many of the Expedia uh, story that they were actually like uh, the, the systems were given like the basic controls were <laughs> in place and somebody found an isolated server was able to take off with like 150 million users take out credit information yeah. in the US, right? It's like pretty much every other uh, other American social security number is out there. Sure. So it's it's insane. Uh, and that uh, you know that that just makes me kind of uh, realize like the one of the benefits of, of a blockchain is that at least you know the level of security. Right. right. Like if you lose your private key or whatever the security mechanism is, uh, it's it's on you, mm -hmm. and it's it's usually hard to kind of do massive distributed uh, hacks, right? like hack one server and get the data of like everybody in the period. There's really no way to do that. Yeah. Right. So that's the, the distribution does provide a layer of distributed security where hacks have to be done one by one uh, rather than just attack a centralized server. There's a lot, clearly a lot of the centralized servers out there. Right, yeah, it's open field right now. Yeah. Let me just see if I can mute these notifications. Uh, I have done that before we started. No okay, problem. Cool. So um, tell me a little bit about the different places where Constellation is applying this distributed reciprocal graph, uh, a direct reciprocal graph. And then uh, how it's doing that in that it's using in those areas. And then I want to dive actually into the mobility space itself. And, and uh, mobility is, is I want you guys are not nowhere near an expert on this space, but it feels like it's changing rapidly around us. And in, in some ways, like the, the first thing that the internet did in the late 90s and through the early 2000s was, was really transform the world of advertising. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a big industry, but advertising doesn't drive the world. What drives the global economy is like manufacturing, uh, finance, and transportation. <laughs> yeah, and actually, mostly people, right? And then people are getting just the whole world is just getting more and more urbanized. You're getting mega cities all across Asia, even US cities are getting bigger. And at the same time, the the, the traditional sort of paradigm of everybody driving a car everywhere is really not going to work. Uh, so, what's the the, uh, sort of the city and the, the, the city of the future going to look like, how do we get there? I think that's what I'm really most interested in understanding, but maybe we should just start by understanding a little bit more about the different areas of the constellation plays it. Yeah, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been kind of one of those series of, of you know, lifting one rock after the next and trying to figure out where the, the, the most fish are. I guess that doesn't make sense with rocks, but you get the <laughs> idea, like, uh, just trying to figure out where the most action is and really, like, I've quickly been able to kind of segment it down into certain buckets. You have enterprise, and enterprise is really into two fashions. One side being more on kind of the emerging innovation side, these groups that are really looking to the promise of, hey, if we were able to integrate this type of technology or adopt it, we can leapfrog some of the issues that we're currently just stuck on. Um, and there's a lot of money in that world, but they don't really move very quickly because they're kind of paid to fail and research and that sort of thing. Then the other side of uh, enterprise would be largely legacy. Those that are like, hey, we don't really care if it's distributed ledger. We just have these issues today that if we could just incrementally make them a little bit better would have a huge impact for us. Those conversations are much trickier, you know, because there's a lot of skepticism, a 
lot of hate. You know, my kid was into trading crypto. This is weird. And so, uh, yes. you know, how it is. so it's largely been a lot of educating, people, you know, and that's not a lot of fun when you're like trying to get to more of the, what are we going to do versus why are we going to do it? And don't get me wrong. It's extremely important, but there is a learning curve right now in the enterprise space, but they are invested. And that's why when I see, you know, headlines that are like blockchain is dead, you're wasting your money. Um, it's usually people that don't know what they're talking about because they're not really at the low level of what's actually happening with the buyers of industry, or they're, they have a, uh, some sort of a vested interest in manipulating the market because they're a target where they want to make money or something like that. Um, but it's not true. Like when you're at the low level of what these people are doing, you can see true companies are investing into real um, use cases that have true adoption viability that are taking place right now. Um, so the other groups that we've been working with are foundations and consortias. Um, and, you know, these are the groups, and this is really kind of be the precipice of, of the conversation when we talk about smart cities. These are the groups that come together with work groups to create standards, both in the academia as well as corporate, um, as well as government. So it's almost kind of like a, a triple vent of government, corporate, and academia, trying to solve largely not, hey, is there a there there, but rather, uh, what are the standards in which we can rally around that are agnostic to the technology or corporate agendas that we then can instill and reward those that adopt across uh, different paradigms? And then you have um, also uh, the crypto community and the developer community. And those we largely don't focus on. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to poo-poo on the crypto community. They're great, but um, I think they've gotten used to being the tail that wags the dog, um, thinking, okay, there's money in Bitcoin, all this stuff. Why aren't we doing more to support the you know, galvanization of this? And that's a bad model because the tech, it's just a weird time to see a Bitcoin ticker going and people largely associate that success with the development of the technology. And, and that could not be any more false. No. Um, and this, in a way, this reminds me of like the dot com bust, right? Like there was this massive dot com boom and, and we are old enough to remember that, right? Uh, in 98, 99, 2000. And it was like, you know, the, the, the internet is going to change everything yeah. overnight, and then of course there was the bust, and and then in like o two o three, I think even up until like o four o five, it was kind of fashionable to be a dot com skeptic. Yeah, like the internet isn't really going to change anything. Okay, maybe it's changed to advertising. Fine, that's like you know, uh, there's some online e commerce happening. It's a very small amount of everything. It's never going to change. Anything. So, yeah. And now you fast forward like 15 years from that, and the internet really has changed everything and it's continuing to change everything. And all that promise of the dot com boom did get delivered to a large extent. It just didn't happen overnight, right? It didn't happen by like 2002 or 2004. Uh, and, and, and it's being delivered now, where you see, like, you know, you, you're beginning to see, like, you know, the impact of local retail of like giants like Amazon. Right. Yeah, the true um, problem. Right. Yeah, the, and the, even though the, the failed startups from the dot com era, like all the delivery startups, there's a whole massive industry of those now. Right. Uh, and and so and some of them are going to go public soon. So that it ju it's just that the the there was the boom where everything was going to change, and then there was a bust where everybody thought nothing was going to change, and then there was the period of like the steady build, which eventually has led to this. And I think some of that there's a there's an echo of that in the in the crypto world, where people were for a while in 17, maybe up until early 18, it, it was a large community of people who were like, this is going to change everything overnight. Right. And you're like, it, it could. There's a lot of promise in the technology, but there's still a lot of gaps. Yes, yeah, and the bricks. <laughs> and the adoption isn't there yet. And the adoption can't happen overnight, right? Everybody in the world is not going to wake up and then suddenly plug into a crypto platform how right like right. On one, one device rather than app and and so that and then there was the bust and now of course it seems to be fashionable to say hey none of this is ever going to happen yeah no and that's exactly what's happening right now i mean so going back to constellation what we've been focused on like going to the idea of a lot of data directed acyclic graph really hums when you have a lot of data coming in so we're not really a fit for like a supply chain management or even financial transactions, even though those do have high volume, we're thinking of stuff that's more source data. And so we've worked largely with OEM manufacturers, like large car part manufacturers, OEMs, uh, companies that manufacture cars, um, you know, the suppliers and so forth. Um, and, you know, when you think like a good use case would be, and I really like this one, we're in this automotive think tank in, in Germany where they have millions of weather sensors and they're trying to create 
uh, a way if a car is autonomously driving down the road and it hits black ice and it notices it, how can you communicate between the weather sensors, the electronic control units in the car, your phone, as well as other cars? You know, it's one thing to have in a controlled setting, but how do you get that amount of data to make a consensus very quickly? And, you know, it's not a whole lot different. I like telling people to connect it to the old BitTorrent. You know, when you think you're downloading a Spider-Man movie, and it actually doesn't just come in as the movie, it comes into like thousands of little pieces that are hosted by a lot of different computers, other, you know, participants in the network. And then it's compiled in the last minute on your computer. And the incentive in return for you getting that movie is you offer up a certain subset of resources of your computer to do the same if somebody else is pulling, you know, a Batman movie or so forth, making it pretty much impossible for somebody to kind of like take it down or figure out where the origin is. Um, and so like, it's almost like a flock of birds when you think about decentralized computing. So uh, one of our uh, use cases we're working on with the transit uh, company uh, agency is Right now, the public transit feed that you're seeing from Google and, and some of these other major agencies is called the GTFS feed. And um, it really is focused on different fleets, you know, and this is more if you're looking at a bus schedule or a train schedule, and they aggregate that data to show the, proper, the appropriate times. And while that seems like, well, you know, isn't it working perfectly, they're not really able to see which exact vehicle is having issues or what operator. They don't really have that much visibility. If we're able to actually notarize and show like right when that, that uh, you know, train starts and putting like the time and the date and the location and all that stuff on an immutable ledger, no matter where they go and what operating system tends to add more complexity to it, they can always use an audit trail to know the exact time and status of that car. It's like proof of movement, if you will. Um, and so we're in the business of, or we're in the mode right now of trying to replace the public transit data feed with ours, which is a third party, um, unbiased, mutable ledger saying this person actually showed up exactly on time. And the benefit for the operators becomes you can start to incentivize. So if you have a whole fleet that's showing up late, it could be just three bad actors, you know, and right now they don't have that level of visibility. So the thing with these use cases, though, is they often seem rather lackluster. You know, when people think of an $800 <laughs> billion dollar market cap that was created, they're like, where's the money? Why are we seeing it today? Kind of your point on the early internet. It's like, you need a wedge to show the vision, to show that there's something bigger you can build on top of. And I think something that's kind of biting people in the butt as far as a blockchain approach is they're shooting out this huge ecosystem that has a lot of variables that need to come to fruition, such as like 5G, you know, uh, telco and that sort of stuff. And it's like, well, when is this coming to fruition? And the answer is we don't know. And that's not what people want to hear. So, yeah. uh, so before I, we're going to dive into this a little bit more, but, uh, you guys in the audience, feel free to, uh, to to you know type a question on that little sidebar, and we'll be you know we'll be more than happy uh, to take it on as well. Um, but I think this is like uh, the, the, the this is also an echo of what happened back in 2004 as well, right? Like uh, people thought that you know like whatever food delivery to the home was going to take off, and and you were like, yes, it has. It's just there was a lot of missing pieces that had to come in, like smartphones, for example, yeah. and, and apps that people could use, uh, and, and sort of ubiquitous like delivery services to like FedEx, and, 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 and so so many things had to come together, both business model-wise, with like platforms, and uh, and then also just financially, but then also like with, uh, with technology. But once it all comes together, you do get to that, but it had to start with very, very kind of almost niche things. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, Amazon started off selling books, um, and it's not. And Jeff Bezos back then had the vision of taking over all of all of commerce and moving it online. But he didn't start by trying to sell uh, you know, clothes or even or cars or something really expensive, which would have made him a lot of money. Because he knew that he needed to start with something that was small enough that it was doable and he could solve a real problem. And then keep iterating and iterating and iterating, and now 25 years later, here we have Amazon taking over the world. I think that is what people, people don't realize is when they see a lot of these use cases, which is like uh, it might not seem like earth shatteringly transformative, in, uh, but it is solving a real problem for real people. Mm -hmm. right? And if you solve a real problem for real people, that gets adoption, and then you incrementally solve another problem and you expand that, and then after a while, you're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can start solving more and more. And then people wake up one day and the world has changed around them. Uh, but it has to be a little bit of, of, of boiling the frog. Um, 
And then the other thing I think a lot of people don't realize is like how large some of these industries are. So just like, for example, trucking in the US, that, that is massive. And it's not something that everybody realizes, mm -hmm. but we, we all have food that shows up in our grocery stores. And uh, how, does it, how does it get from <laughs> Mexico or wherever it comes from, or, or you know, from Australia or someplace and, and show up in our uh, you know, freshly packed, right? Ships, uh, you know, rail, and a lot of it in the US is, is France, and that's right. a trillion dollar industry. And if you can make that incrementally better, there's probably tens of millions of value, right? Um, and the question is all about like, how do you do it? It's not going to be a flashy whiz bang app on your phone that like, like Facebook solves it all, right? right. Um, and it's, it's not even necessarily direct to consumer, but it is hugely massive uh, and valuable. So my kind of next thought process on that is, is in this mobility space, uh, there's, there's so much talk about like, smart cities. Uh, this whole idea that the city of the future is, is going to be very different from cities today. And we, we live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, been to quite a few US cities. I have to say this one by two ones in the US. Uh, my wife uh, grew up in Spain and lived in Barcelona. And she landed in Portland. And she refuses to live anywhere else in the US. <laughs> to her, this is she loves it. She loves it. Uh, and it's it is not necessarily the weather that, <laughs> that brought her here, you know, coming from like a Mediterranean climate. Uh, it is just like uh, the, the city just works relatively well. Uh, but uh, that isn't true for a lot of American cities. And I even people who live here, if you if you go to other parts of the world, you realize that this you know, I am a personal fan of Amsterdam, for example, or Tokyo. Uh, but but that's not even where they're going, right? They're going to a much different uh, future in terms of like the, the smart city, the city of the future. Talk to us a little bit about that. Like, what does that look like? Like, what would when my daughter is like in her forties, what is she going to be living in in terms of a city value that is um, And then what does that uh, what does that kind of translate into what's happening on the ground today yeah. in the U.S. and other parts of the world? And how do we get there? And then how to blockchain? Because blockchain is just one part of that whole. Of yeah, show. yeah, it's a fun. I got. I love this topic. In fact, I'll start with kind of the mobility piece, and then go into the smart cities. The um, so we're part of a, a consortium called uh, Mobi M O B I. I think it's DLT .mobi is the URL. Uh, they're the largest uh, mobility consortium in the world, and they've been around since this uh, May of last year. And the reason why this is extremely important, and it's why I feel like blockchain is really bringing a lot of groups together is that for the first time you think about these OEM companies that you know uh, BMW and Daimler a great example two competing companies um, when you think about an autonomous network of cars being on the road you have say a you know a Mercedes at front in, in, uh, at a stoplight then you got a BMW three or four cars back really for an autonomous network of vehicles to work together they have to share data it's the only we have to share. It's only in the best interest to share the lidar data, the camera data, any sensor data back. And, and if there's a batch of black cars on the road, right? Everybody wants to know that, regardless right. of which car they're driving. And guess what? Everybody wants everybody to know that. Everybody <laughs> wants everybody to know. It's, it's mission critical. But there's two problems. One, security. When you're doing over-the-air sharing of data, there are security flaws. Um, and then two, IP, you know, who's going to own it? Who stores, who's handling the data? Are they duplicating the data? So then all of a sudden, distributed ledger comes out and they're like, wait a minute, we have the ability now to coexist by allowing validation criteria to only send data on the ledger that can only be unlocked using a private key when necessary across the transaction. So the term mobility almost is synonymous with IoT because it's really about machines communicating with another autonomously. Uh, exchanging transactions almost in a sovereign way. Um, and so even BMW has stated, we're no longer a manufacturing company, we're now a services company. And they want to turn these automobiles that largely sit dormant for 95% of the time, activate them so they can already start, they can start to participate in a network that value, uh, adds value to everybody. And so last year we saw a partnership with Daimler and BMW. We also saw a partnership with uh, uh, Embraer and uh, Boeing. I mean, these are mortal enemies, and they're like, wait a minute, we now have a way where we can interoperate and create new ways of this network ability. Like IoT is only as powerful as the software that allows them to connect. And right now, since those protocols are so 
guarded. There's, you know, you don't want to exchange that data. So that's why all these things don't actually communicate because the central authority is of question. And so it's really exciting to see these companies do hackathons and work groups to create standards around true mobility initiatives. Like how do you have a car that has a wallet that say you want to have the right of way on the road, you can actually um, stake you know, certain tokens or value and other people would absorb it. Now you have the right of way on the road. And there's this exchange taking place in which you are just focused on being you. You don't have to deal with any of that. So, so you're saying that I could be driving down the highway and get to like really bad traffic and say, look, I'm, I, I'm in a real hurry and I'm willing to pay more. Correct. And other cars would just get out of the way. way. And it would happen automatically. And there's um, use cases that have been developed that show this within test models. So it's not like we're beyond the world of theoretical at this point. This is actually starting to happen. Um, or if you hit the black ice, instead of that data going up to Waze, and Waze being the central authority that takes the credit, you get the value of the data creation. And now that sits in your wallet, you can use it to go to work faster the next day. Um, and, I mean, and even like, I mean, Waze, right? Like, I might hit, I might be driving a, uh, an all wheel drive SUV. And I might hit that patch of ice, so just say it through because I have written it right? Um, and I might not even realize this, right? Because it's the, the, the car may realize in its ECU that it had to do some adjustment. But cars are so sophisticated nowadays that I wouldn't I might not even realize it, just keep driving through. But for the rare wheel drive 20-year-old convertible who's coming up behind me, that patch of ice might be a much bigger problem. And it could just share that data with him and uh, that car, the car might slow down and navigate it or just switch lanes and go around it. And none of us, that, you know, the, none of us actually, the, the human doesn't need to even be in the correct on that. Because as these sensors get more sophisticated, we just not fast enough. Right? Like I'm not going to notice half the time something happened. And even when I do notice half the time, I'm not going to open up ways and, and put that information into ways. I couldn't be bothered. No, <laughs> totally. So, like, well, yeah, so thinking about mobility, like, Brian uh, Bellendorf, who's the executive director of Hyperledger, has a quote that everybody loves, which is blockchain is the team sport. And I cannot drive this notion home enough that the reason why some people have a hard time with it is because they have a capitalistic mindset. And this is a decentralized approach, meaning you have to partner, you have to join forces with enemies, with everybody. Um, and so if you go into this with a capitalist mindset, you're going to be very let down. Um, this, 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 is, this is fascinating because I, you see this a lot already in, in hyper. Uh, especially in the like, payments industry, where uh, people are like, there's a lot, huge amount of money, and everybody is, you know, everybody's fighting with each other for market share in different segments. But at the same time, you'll, you'll find a lot of the time when you look behind the scenes that people who seem like mortal enemies mm -hmm. are collaborating on different things, right? Like, so you think Visa and MasterCard are, uh, are mortal enemies, and, and I guess to a certain extent they are, right? Uh, but they share a lot of risk and fraud data each other. They have the ability to route certain types of transactions from one system to another system. So it doesn't matter which one you connect to. Uh, and, and whenever I hear about that, I'm always like flabbergasted. It's like, it's, it's usually not very public, but it's like uh, the, the, the real reason is exactly what you said, that nobody, like none of them want fraudsters in the system. Right? Yeah. Like, and it doesn't really matter if a fraudster is attacking MasterCard today, because they will go to Visa. Right. Totally. And if wherever they start it, they want to spread spread that information around and realize whatever those fraud signatures are so that everybody can keep the fraudsters out of the system. And then there's this it's always kind of a cooperation. There is always some competition and then there's always cooperation in a different aspect. Uh and, and you know, everybody is everybody else's vendor or customer at some place. Uh and I think yeah. the the it's it's interesting to see that that's happening in more and more industries. But I think maybe payments started earlier just because Payments relies on networks, and those you know, Visa and Mastercard were built back in the seventies and eighties. Um, but as more and more of those networks get built, there's so much value in interoperability and data sharing that somebody starts unlocking it at some point. I mean, it, it, it's very fast. It's like I said, it, we we've kind of been culturalized in the sense of America of like mergers, acquisition, consolidation, fiefdoms, power, and blockchain kind of spreads it back out. It's like, hey, you have to play nice or else you're going to get left behind. And these standards are going to start to surface in which, hey, you're going to be incentivized where you're going to be regulated if you don't use them. And it's not like the cops. It's more of like, hey, this is an exponentially safer and more secure way. You have to be kind of an idiot not to do it. Um, so moving from mobility into like the smart connected cities, um, when you think about this ability for groups to interoperate, um, 
that's really the promise you start to see in these connected news, like a power play of like, holy cow, we can interoperate these systems. Everything down from like, hey, you got off the max, you get on a scooter, you get into a car to go or a, or a shared, shared ride. You have one universal ID that manages all those things that's connected also to your rent, maybe connected to your utilities. And you look at some of the, the early adopters of this mentality, and they've been doing this before blockchain. They saw the promise of a connected city. The top one being Singapore, um, yeah. second place being London, and I think third is Zurich right now. And, and it's kind of mapped by the amount of blockchain entities that are in those. I think like Zurich has like 450 different groups that are focused on blockchain. What, what do they call it? Uh, Silicon Mount. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, and it's fun. It's cool to see areas that are untraditional being like, hey, we're going to be a rock star in this area. And Singapore, the way that they've really approached it, which I think is smart, because this isn't about just like, hey, we have new technology that's going to change your life. Going back to the home grocer dot com thing back in the in late nineties that failed. Adoption needs to be a big part of it. So how do you create a new technology but also disciplines that allow people to absorb the technology and somehow meet in the middle? And finance, and as you can tell with those three three uh, cities, Singapore, London, and Zurich, they're all very finance heavy. Right, they're all big global finance hubs. But it's funny you didn't mention the biggest of them all, which is New York. Yeah, yeah. And you have to say when, you, when like I mean, I live in New York. I love the city. I love the people. It's got an amazing culture. But its mobility system, and in many ways, the city is just crazy. <laughs> and, and I think they have a mentality around let's let, let God sort them out. And there also is city corruption <laughs> that has like a, uh, a piece of it. Oh yes, that's you know? a part of the old New York. Yeah, just let, let God sort them out. Whatever surfaces will absorb. But then there's city corruption, and that's where you, you think of uh, Chicago. It's just got rated as the number one most corrupt city in America. Illinois is being number three. And they want to parse off and be their own state. And they're going to be really slow to absorb the connected city because that comes with accountability. Um, you know, a lot of these things that they want to, they, they want to control the central power of this. With Singapore, the way that they've approached it is they said, start with the housing. Let's put DLT on housing contracts, um, lending contracts, anything that has to do with the livability of people in their, in their houses, whether that's landlords or so forth. Um, so they started there. Then they went after energy. How do we handle, you know, the use of energy on the distributed ledger? Um, making it so that these groups can focus on that. Um, and then the third piece being like mobility. How do we connect the systems, whether it's the transportation or individual cars, to communicate in that as well? And what you'll notice is that three-layer approach, they're not focused on finance. Finance is something that they're trying to do from a different perspective, which is riddled with regulations and standards that they can't just you know, shove through, where they actually can do it on some of these legacy uh, modalities like uh, like um, energy and housing, because putting housing contracts on a distributed ledger is actually a pretty easy thing. Yeah. Handling finance contract transactions is really messy. Yeah, I think in Singapore's case, they have this unique problem that housing in Singapore is a Singapore problem. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not really connected into Malaysia, it is, but there's only a few links, right? Uh, but as soon as you look at finance, Singapore is the financial hub of Southeast Asia, right. even a large chunk of Asia. So I suspect that in finance, it's harder for them to move just by themselves uh, because there's so many other constituents, right? Like they have to understand how, if, for example, if they ripped out one of their payment systems and replaced it with like a distributed ledger, I do know that they have uh, they have done some uh, finance projects, even in the finance space. They're probably the one of the most advanced in blockchain adoption globally. Right. I would say it's Singapore, um, Zurich would be another one. Uh, Hong Kong is beginning to do a lot more. Uh, but it's it, from a government perspective, they have this it's called Project uh, Project Orion, where they're looking at using blockchain to synchronize between the central bank and a lot of the the, the big banks and then. Uh, you know, the, the central bank is always in doing transactions with its banks, to, whether it's to manage monetary policy, whether it's to ensure payments get settled and forex and all of that, right? And those are massive value. Right. Usually in the, for Singapore, it would be in like billions, and for the, for the US, it would be in sometimes in the trillions. Uh, and they're beginning to try to use doing blockchain technology for that. Uh, the thing is, it's not something that's an end consumer ever sees, right? right? Like if the, the overnight repo market is moving, whatever, 200 billion a day in New York with the New York Fed, it doesn't, how do I know about it? 
You only know about it when it fails, and then you have a financial crisis. <laughs> yeah, because banks are going to bust. Uh, so that's where they're trialing it. They're not pushing it out to the general public yet. And I suspect it's because of the larger geopolitical implications. But in things like housing and, and mobility, they can do that. Right. They can say, hey, you know, the rest of Southeast Asia can watch us. Well, we do this. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think a wedge that I'm seeing some of these enterprise, you know, banks and, you know, uh, financial companies get involved in is in the rewards and points area because yeah. being able to get people used to blockchain interoperability, like, hey, you now have Amex points that you can interoperate with our partner over at uh, Alaska Airlines and trade those. And the implications if a company locks you out of your points is a lot less than it would be cash, you know? And when you, you mentioned early on giving people that sovereign ability to manage their own stuff. While that's very powerful, we've gotten very lackadaisical about allowing corporates to manage stuff for us. Yeah. Next thing you know, your daughter loses her private key and she has no, she can't control her face anymore or whatever it may be, you know? And, <laughs> yeah, that's, that was a bad example, but you get the idea that like you, it comes down to the individual. And so when you think about, hey, okay, we're going to put the power in your hands, but we're only going to have you manage your rewards points. You know, I messed up. Okay, let's figure out ways that we can rebound from this in, in different uh, disciplines so that people can restore their points. But that gets people kind of going back to that frog in the water. And they get warmed up to like, all right, now we're ready to actually transition you know, just so much education. I and mean, you know, John Oliver said something on HBO that I'm not a big fan of his bit on this, but he did say something very funny. It's like, you know, blockchain is, or Bitcoin is everything about finance and everything about computers you don't understand combined. And it's true, like, it's amazing how many people I've tried to explain distributed ledger technology and it just doesn't click, which shows that this may take a while to see people adopt, or we may be lucky enough to the point where they don't even know. Like, it's just like, hey, why did this just get all of a sudden better? Why am I all of a sudden getting dividend payouts from advertisers when I see ads? It's like, oh, because your data is your data and you now have it on a wallet and here's how you can interact with it. I mean, how many people understand what, when you type in it, when you click on a link and it says HTTPS in the right. address bar, how many people truly understand what that means? Right. But they have some sense that if there's a little like, you know, lock icon in my, Browser that's better than if there's We're no, no. Uh, sort of. and there's still so much like phishing that happens, right? And a, that, that's a whole uh, broken uh, model in, in many ways. But people understand those things, uh, but nobody really understands TCP. I think nobody really understands right. uh, how HTTP and all of this stuff works. But people still manage to use it. But it is important for developers to understand mm -hmm. uh, at least like HTTP versus HTTPS and certificates and all of that. And then there are people in the ISPs and in the, who really need to understand even TCP IP and routing because that, that's what they do in the DNS and all of that. And I think that's what we're beginning to see a little bit of is in the financial world, uh, people beginning to say, hey, this technology is useful. Uh, I'm not sure about the whole retail ICO thing, but I can take this technology, plug it in and solve a bunch of like, I have three backend partners here and four over there. I can plug them all together. We can all agree that this is how things should work. We can write a smart contract or whatever you want to call it. And, and, and everybody can, with confidence, ensure and say that, yes, it has worked 100% all the time, exactly the way we said it. And, and you know, we can encapsulate all of that and automate. Yeah. And now that's nice. We, I had a team of like 10 people somewhere who used to just do that on overnight settlement of repos or whatever, because paper, there's always going to be errors, right? Uh, and now we can free them up and they can go do something else. And it's the, just the number of errors is, is reduced massively. And that's where you see a lot of projects within financial institutions is the stuff that the, the general public doesn't see and definitely doesn't yeah. understand. But it is very high value. Yeah. Uh, the, the global forex uh, markets move about 4.7 trillion a day. That's and and I think the the record day for the, much of it is settled via this one bank in New York called CLS, which just does settlement internationally. Uh, I think their record day was like eleven trillion or something. Yeah, can't even comprehend that in one day, right? And it's just so much, right? Like you're like somebody in in China is buying a business in South Africa, and and they they have to move that money, and much of it goes through in dollars, and much of it goes through CLS, and so. Uh, that's where you're like, hey, if we can make this, we can reduce the percentage of errors slightly, and we can automate this. Suddenly, there's like two billion in that that has been ex that has been extracted, and there's so much better 
Uh, and of course, we can make it real time, we can make it automated. Um, and it's interesting to realize that it's not like that's what's happening in the mobility space as well. And a lot of it is it's not necessarily end retail consumers suddenly saying, hey, I'm going to be I'm going to get a new device or whatever. I'm using the same systems, but you know, they all work better now. And yeah. the number of times my landlord miscalculated uh, my payment or, or lost my data and I had to re-enter it into a system, this doesn't happen. Right, because it's all tracked on the blockchain, and you know, the landlord system may get hacked, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and it's I, I mean, I guess if I had one thing to just drive home here, it's like the ecosystem play is it. It's so important. Um, even in mobility, when you think about a car, you have title transfers, you've got insurance, you know, you have car sharing. I mean, there's there's diagnostics. There's so many different things that kind of come into this car that most people when they get it, they don't even think about. You know, to your point. Um, and just seeing the convergence of those things is really starting to make amazing things happen. Again, I would have lost a bet to see Daimler and BMW participate in, <laughs> in, a, in a project together, but they see that like, wow, we have to come closer in order for this to work. Um, and, and some of it is, it's not going to work if, no, if they don't uh, partner up together, right? Like uh, the, the problem of the black eyes on the road is a problem for everybody. But if only one in ten cars is reporting that data, yeah. and only one in ten cars is getting that data, it will make some incremental benefit to the system. But it's when you have eight in ten who are reporting it, and eight in ten who are observing it, that's when you get the magical effect of like there's a patch of black eyes. All the cars come up, they just switch lanes, drive around it, and continue. And then drivers don't even know why it's happening. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then after a few hours, some you know, some whatever uh, machine gets scheduled to go out there and salt it or melt it or do whatever with it, right? Yeah. And that's all happening automatically. And maybe you save a couple of lives in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's happening today. I mean, like, so there's a, in Florida, there's this 80,000 acre kind of parcel of land where this um, kind of step for community has been set up that has an autonomous driving fleet. So it picks, wow. retired people up, takes them to places. And it's because it's fully controlled, you know, it's a controlled setting. And so it works really well. In fact, we're testing that kind of transit thing I was mentioning as far as the proof of movement. Um, but when you start to take that into, to your point, only certain cars are participating, take it to a, a level five monsoon in Cairo, Egypt. I mean, we're talking hell. It's just, there's no way. And you have vendors like Tesla who are making the right move saying, we're just going to, we're going to be open. We're going to push out all of our data and make it super open. Hopefully other people can catch up. But just being that one car that does that is not going to save every use case. Yeah, you might have a great experience in your test number. Right. That's one in 20, 30, 50 cars. Yeah. Day. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah, that is uh, that is fascinating. And, and just in that same vein, like uh, my co founder, Angela, at a previous startup, worked on uh, a deal that uh, the Australian Stock Exchange uh, it does all its cash settlements on a blockchain. Right. And that's like, so what does that mean? It right. means that if you're buying or selling equities in Australia, uh, you're going to find that the system is more efficient now. And as a retail person, you you, you may not even notice that. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's mostly brokers who are, uh, who are actually placing the trade and executing them. They're going to get more efficiency out of it. And yeah, it's a massive business. And it's you know they do, they do billions a day, and that's that's going to drive a lot of efficiency. But it's the consumers will see the benefits; they may not even realize it. Uh, but that's when more and more of those sorts of backend systems transition away that we start seeing the true end nature of, uh, of all of this. I also think that the infrastructure is hugely important. Uh, the first wave of like blockchain adoption was really sort of, uh, you know, thinkers, early adopters, mm -hmm. people who were like, you know, uh, I'm going to buy pizza with my Bitcoin wallet. It's just like, yeah, yeah, that's right. cool, right? <laughs> uh, and there was nobody between me and that pizza delivery uh, company. And you're like, okay, that's kind of cool, but how is this going to change the world? It's going to change the world, but somebody builds massive infrastructure mm -hmm. that everybody can just say, hey, I, I don't even know how what my HTTPS means, but I know that it's more secure, so I'm just going to deploy to uh, uh, you know, Google Cloud or AWS or something like that. And I am just writing my little website and serving my customers, but I know it's safer doing this way than what, whatever, however you did 10 years ago. Uh, and that's what we need in the blockchain world as well. It's like infrastructure layers, which really bring all those benefits and are as plug and play as it can be. And that's when I think we'll start seeing more and more adoption. Starting with the largest businesses, the largest use cases, using it with proof of 
concept and expand it from there. It would be a five, 10 year journey. Yeah, and what we're seeing, I mean, so a lot of these groups, and just to educate a bit, I know you understand this, but the, the difference between a public or a private blockchain, or oh, permissioned yeah. or permissionless. And I, you know, we live in such a polarizing society that it's like you either vaccinate your kids or you don't vaccinate them at all. And it's like, well, I mean, maybe there's a middle ground here. And same, oh, it's true. You know, yeah, like there's, there's all sorts of variables and uh, hopefully that didn't stir too many pots. But <laughs> it's just showing that we're in a polarized culture. And, oh, I want to completely lock down private blockchain, which is like, well, isn't that just a really like well-secured database? Um, or you want something public where it's like anybody can join. You don't really know who's on it or whatnot. It's, so what we're seeing very rapidly is like consortia blockchains, permission blockchains that are open but have certain delegates that control certain inputs and outputs, allowing these companies to kind of crawl before they run with the toggles that say, okay, there are open blockchains that we can interoperate with, but we're only going to tap into them in certain use cases. But for now, how can Walmart get lettuce on supply chain management within a controlled environment that has a full audit trail that they can query in real time to say, we know where in the system it broke down so we can halt it, saving us X, X lives or time or money or whatever it may be from that stuff getting into the supply. Um, you know, that becomes interesting. And blockchain really does, and Street Ledger, bring out accountability. We're seeing insurance companies that we've even talked to some that are in, considering putting black boxes in cars. So yeah. you're, you have a sensor on your windshield that a rock hits it, the pressure tense knows that it was broken, it knows the time of day, the location, all this data gets appended to that black box, Say the car gets in an awful axe or something happens, they can take that out and they can actually see the true, you know, audit trail of when that was notarized. And that has a lot of value when we live in kind of a crazy data world that needs to be regulated. Completely. I think we're basically out of time here. I didn't uh, I didn't necessarily see any questions uh, from folks. Last call on uh, 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 on any of that stuff. Uh, no. Okay. Cool. So then I'm going to wrap up with uh, maybe just one question. Uh, which is um, what in this whole like blockchain mobility and the sort of the infrastructure space? What do you see that personally excites you the most, and what what personally scares you the most? Um, I think what personally excites me the most is the rebalance of value. Like I think that there's so much untapped value. If you have you know a glass of water sitting here may not mean that much to us, but may mean something wildly important somewhere else. And I understand transferring water is not an easy thing, but I think that there's so much value that is locked right now. And how do we unlock that to balance it? And that could be mobility, that could be finance. I certainly think that voting needs to be something, taxes, where those are going. So this is why we're seeing a lot of pushback because people don't want this stuff to be unveiled. But like to me, that's where if people were more educated, they would be demanding this stuff. Be like, well, I want that transparency. So I like that it isn't about putting more money in corporate pockets, which we are we have no shortage of them. Um, so that's what excites me. What scares me the most is a fully autonomous network. Like that, like when you start thinking about a network that understands how to gain reputation and doesn't have a way to be turned off, we start entering a weird world where you don't really know the repercussions of an autonomous network that can make decisions, you know, sovereign machines exchanging um, that we can interfere with. And we don't know the implications of that. It's kind of like us tinkering with artificial intelligence right now. Sure, it's contained. Quantum computers might be contained. But if this thing starts to get out of control, we're not smart enough to understand how to combat that. Um, so, but I know that's kind of the futuristic Skynet type of stuff. Yeah. You know, I said people kind of say, you know, Skynet, right? Like, yeah. And it's like, well, that's just one potential end case. <laughs> totally, totally, yeah. Like, but it's a big one. <laughs> it, is a, it is a big one. But there's also the... The, the ability of like humans to kind of game that right. and say, hey, let me build in capabilities into the systems and and just set up the rules. So like you know, if you read the kind of Asimov Foundation stories, right. like the the three laws of robotics sort of thing, uh, those are actually pretty decently thought out. Uh, but somebody else could tweak that, <laughs> right? And 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 maybe set up laws in a different way to lead to other outcomes, right? And it's not always possible to even predict when when you have these sorts of massive systems. It's always also not always possible to kind of uh, like notice, right? And I think that's why the blockchain piece of it is important because the transparency is hugely needed. <laughs> if if it's all sitting within whoever, whatever, Google, Apple, name your you know, name your favorite Google, uh, what's the chances that anybody will ever notice that right. there's something being built there which is going to create a problem?
problem or the data is being siphoned off or something we don't want. At least on a blockchain, 99% of people won't, but the 1% of you know that that uh, you know whatever teenager who's just bored but understands computer and starts digging into this corner and trying to why these transactions work like this, they might actually pick up on that and be like, hey, there's a problem here, and then somebody else might actually pick it up, right? But when the, when it's when it's private and it's all uh, opaque, you are really trusting the man. Yeah. At least when it's public, there is more chances of some light shining. Last thing I'll say is I think it's the most exciting time to be alive. <laughs> it's a wild it time. time. It is a wild time. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, I think we're uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, feel free to um, feel free to tweet at us and ask us questions on uh, on on Twitter or any of the you know LinkedIn or any of the other channels. And uh, thank you for listening.